<laughs> we cut up cut up all possible future sources of income for me. <laughs> my my apologies. I'd forgotten to turn on the recorder. I just turned it on. This is the OGM call for Thursday, May 30th, 2024. We missed uh, a couple of check-ins here. So keep going, Gil. My apologies. I'm, I'm, do I'm done. You turn on the recorder. I stopped talking. <laughs> I'll step in. Um, I noticed while everybody was checking in that one of the reasons that I hold back from going first is that I really appreciate how precious time is. And there's a piece of me, I don't want to go first because somebody else might say something and I'll want to add to it. And if I've already gone, my time is gone. Um, and also, I want to make sure that what I'm saying, because I have such a short time, what's really important. And the last call we had, Jerry, you had sent um, a study about AI. And I didn't get to mention it um, on that call because it was still just going through my head. And when I read it, two things came to mind. One is that I felt like I had an epiphany, which everybody else probably realized already, but I hadn't, which was a lot of research money with AI seems to be getting fed to like management consultants and the experimentation seems to all be done with work and productivity. And that kind of like really upset me because I thought if this money were being funneled into schools and children were really learning, like the whole, everything could really be shifted. So that was one thought that I had because not that I think it happens in a, in a nefarious way, but the way our social systems are set up it would make sense that people would be hanging out and talking and, hey, there's some money for this grant. Oh, I know somebody here. We're working here. And anyway, that was part of it. But the other thing that came from that study was that in things that weren't considered typical management consulting tasks, which number one, I wanted to know what exactly were those things, it showed that using AI actually led to worse results. And I thought that was a conversation that people should be having. So that's part of what's going on in my brain. In the week that went by in different places, I've been speaking to people and I feel like a lot of people like the idea of coming together in a group and being that being like those school children possibly and working on a hypothetical problem. At least certain people said they would prefer to be a hypothetical problem where as a group, and AI could be a part of it, but as a group, we learn together how we would use that AI. And I know that um, Gil and some other people have mentioned wanting to know how other people are using it. And the third piece is that most of you know, I like to talk to people that feel very differently about different things. And that includes the topic of AI. So I talk to certain people that hear those two letters and a wall comes up. They don't wanna hear anything about it. And I approach that problem the way I would anything the idea is bring everybody together and engage in an activity together because that's how you build trust and that's also how you eliminate the fears that different people have and maybe close some of those i don't want i don't know if the word would be loopholes but how you guard against those risks that are valid does that make sense? That last sentence or yes? Okay. So that that that's my check-in. That's what's on my mind. <laughs> uh, 
One of my favorite sayings about social change goes like this. To make change, you have to, you have to, to, to change the circumstances, you have to sing to them their own melody. Uh, otherwise they can't play. And I look at this group of smart people and I think, what is going on here? Um, and uh, I come up not with a zero, but with a kind of opaque sense that I don't know what people are thinking about. Uh, to me, uh, a practical thing that happened this week was getting Klaus and Stuart Kaufman together for a conversation about soil regeneration. And I like that kind of concrete activity a lot. On top of it is the feeling that we all know we're gonna die, uh, either from heat or flood uh, or civic violence or whatever. Uh, the tsunami of climate change is upon us. Uh, people are dying worldwide. Uh, it's a mess and we're not talking about it. And I think that is actually quite weird to me. End of thought. Yeah, it's actually it's actually a, a very strange time, um, but the 
the uh, good news is I participated yesterday um, in a uh, call organized by Regenerate America, and it had over 200 people join, and these were all executives from NGOs from around the country. <clears throat> um, and they are, I mean, all act, food and agriculture focused because the farm bill has dropped you know, in, in the house. Um, so I published an article in the local paper um, and the editor actually interacted with me and wanted me to um, to be more inclusive and so on. And so, so it was, it was uh, uh, quite amazing because it was a really um, pretty direct and, and a sort of brutal article. Um, but it was, you know, it was well received. And then um, you check in and you, you see that the entire regenerative movement um, is uh, up and, 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 and engaging. You know, you have thousands of people right now engaging in their local communities uh, to bring attention to we're about to spend $1.5 trillion uh, that will direct the future of agriculture for the next five years. And if we screw this up, that would be a real mess. Um, but if we uh, want to make changes, then those changes are going to be disruptive you know, to to the industry, you know, similar disruptive to the way the electrification is, is disruptive to the energy sector. But it was, um, uh, I mean, it's 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 amazing to see how this is you know, somewhat trickling in. Um, and then, so I got into an exchange with the executive director from Project Drawdown um, because, I mean, the guy acted like he's a, sh a chill for the industry, um, basically taking apart some of our arguments about regenerative agriculture, sort of belittles it. Um, and then, um, so that, that was, that was uh, and I ended up the, the point person all of a sudden <clears throat> in engaging this guy. So, so you have, you really have uh, you really have uh, so, uh, the, the forms clarifying you now becoming clear into 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 where we are where we are heading. Um, but it is, <clears throat> I mean, you have this 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 great interest on the one side, and then you know, as as Doug is also saying, an astonishing lack of awareness in the general population. You now and and. When you when you step back, and I think all of us are sort of watching from a more distant perspective, you know, more looking from the outside in. Um, it is just astonishing how key decision makers, um, uh, you know, continue to to treat this economy like it's sort of their own playground and. Uh, in complete disregard of the commons. And I think that's really what sort of defines our time, you know, this disregard of the commons. Like, like it's just not important. And um, you see more and more, and I think the, the US is sort of the only country in the world that really has uh, the capacity to have where, where a population uh, is articulate enough, is strong enough, is educated enough, is rambunctious enough, you know, is uh, willing to 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 uh, cast off norms and and engage, and um, it will be it will be coming. Uh, uh, it will come to to inflection points. There's no question, right? Because uh, you have on the one side you know, a group that. Uh, uh, that disregards the established norms, disregards what we, uh, you know, look at, at laws and and uh, and agreements on how to on how to interact, um, and then you have on the other side a group that wants to follow the rules and just insist on 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 uh, 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 everybody should should play, you know, according to these rules. And it's just not going to work if one side doesn't <laughs> doesn't follow, right? And so, uh, 
you know, then comes the the question: What if? What if? You know, we are all saying, okay, if you don't want to follow the rules, then let's chuck them. You know, and freestyle. And that's typically when things break. Now that's when uh, when uh, you have conflicts arising. Um, but this time, I mean, I find myself in this crazy position of uh, um, being like a, uh, in a in a uh, sort of revolutionary phase, you know, because what what this group is working on is highly disruptive, um, and it's far more effective than. Uh, being out in the street, even with thousands of people, because that doesn't do anything. But when you get on the inside and you start working the system on the inside and you're turning it on itself, then that becomes really effective and it forces the other side you know, to show its face. You know, because in order to push back on that, then you have to really uh, openly come out and say, yeah, we don't care about the rules. Um, and and then that creates you now uh, a whole different scenario, but uh, but yeah, so we so we we uh, uh, and we are in a you know AI supported world where where you can uh, where you can uh, develop strategies and and communication uh, 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 ideas and so on. In ways that are that are pretty pretty darn effective, but we are heading you know, towards conflict um, because when you just take this farm bill right now, um, one point five trillion dollars is a heck of a lot of money, um, and the way it's being spent just doesn't make any sense. It's just not that it doesn't make any sense; it's actually dangerous, right? Because it actually, uh, I mean, it's actually destructive. Uh, you know, to to our personal health, to the environment, to water, to air. I mean, you know, it's just it's just incomprehensible. But you have vested interests in there who, who are very wealthy people, and they're just absolutely unwilling to step back. You know, so then, where where does this go? And so, I think a lot of this, I mean, when you see billionaires, you know, lead, led by Elon Musk, throw parties to get Trump re-elected, re and then you look at who Trump is, and you, and you say, are you guys completely insane? I mean, do you even have do you even have an idea what this means and what this will do if you get this guy into office? Because if you think you can control him, you know, then you're the same idiots that put a whole bunch of other uh, uh, demagogues into office, and it, every single time ended in breakage, every single time it ended in, in, in catastrophic... Uh, uh, scenarios so this is not going to be no different but when you see the insistence of uh, people in power uh, moneyed and so on on maintaining their way of life and maintaining control um, perfectly willing to break stuff uh, in order to keep it that way that's where we're heading right so that's that's uh, there's no way around it uh, so you may as well get ready for it um and no one really knows what that means you now because we are in a completely different environment and you can actually do stuff sitting in in your house and engaging with people around the world you know that was that's adding a completely new dimension to it but uh um uh it's going to be yeah it's going to be a hot summer so the good thing is you know we I'm I'm we, we're actually picking up clients um the uh and and it's it's because mostly because we developed an AI capacity that uh, that is really uh, uh, quite amazing, um, I, and I'm saying this, you know, using it. But I mean, it's just stunning when you when you interact with a really well trained uh, chatbot. You know, it's uh, uh, it's astounding what what uh, uh, what what uh, breath this thing has. Um, so the good thing, the good news is that, uh, you know, farmers are becoming aware of it. Uh, uh, people, people are becoming more aware of, uh, uh, the, the changes that, uh, are possible you now to, to make in, in the, in their communities and, uh, wanting to do so. Um, 
So that's the good part of it. Let's just let's see where it goes. You know, it's uh, you 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 just you just can't uh, predict and um and and, and you know, to Doug's point, uh, no one is talking about it. Everybody is talking about it. Everybody is talking is upset, right? People who are wanting to vote for Trump are all upset because they realize that stuff really doesn't work, but they just don't have enough information they don't even have necessarily the cognitive capacity to process uh, what's going on now uh, so they're being they're being you know, basically abused uh you know, with with this m misinformation and 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 propaganda and and uh manipulation they're experiencing but people who who, who are thoughtful know quite well what's going on uh, and and uh very upset when you look at the comment section in, in the Washington Post and New York Times, everywhere, people are very engaged. Uh, and it, they're just not out in the street. And being out in the street is useless anyway, right? I mean, it's just, it's just uh, uh, leads nowhere. So, so yeah, so I think it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a incredibly exciting time because uh, uh, technology and everything around you is advancing at, at a pace that is just stunning. Um, but then it's also a scary time because it is a major power shift uh, that's on their way, and that has never really uh, that has never really gone without breakage. You know? Um, what's present to me right now is we're never going to be done with our work. There's always going to be work to be done. And how important the journey is, uh, how important we feel right now and pay attention to this moment how we feel with each other and our, with ourselves and just from the moment we fall asleep to the moment we wake up and throughout our day, just like, I just updated um, my own focus and that is, and I have, I keep on coming back. It's like a circle. I'll be like, yes, that's it. And then I'll kind of go off on this tangent and then I'll come back and go, yeah, no, that that's it. That's it. That's really what's important. It's, you know, basic stuff like mindful sleep and mindful eating and mindful conversations, uh, stressing mindfully, mindful working. And what I often notice is that we don't know when to celebrate. Uh, even if for this call, I'm not sure what celebration looks like, but where do we... 
when do we congratulate ourselves and each other for not only the effort that we're putting into our days and our work, but into, you know, into our passions, but celebrating each other for just showing up and sharing our worlds. I'm just, I'm fascinated by and inspired by all of you every time we have a call. So I guess this moment is um, a cause for celebration. <laughs> so thank you. I love how different the pace of these calls is to our topic calls. Um, and it does take me back a little bit to Quaker meeting. My favorite meeting is Wilton monthly meeting in Wilton, Connecticut. And in the winter, they had a fireplace <clears throat> that somebody would come in and light before the meeting started. And it was just beautiful. And at the beginning, we were talking about silence a bit. And I'm a big fan of silence. And I've learned a lot of lessons from silence. I remember a sociology text years ago that that if you meet i think it was and this was very role role specific but if you if you're if you're dating a danish woman and she invites you to meet the family the smartest thing you can do is speak only when spoken to and when asked questions answer them as quickly as you can just like i don't mean fast but in as few words as you can yeah. because that shows a great deal of respect that the silence is respect uh, another sociology story from the same text was about how in uh, in the tundra, in basically Eskimo Lap Inuit country, a social call because people live pretty far apart from each other, but lives are on line all the time because it's so dangerous. Perfectly valid social call might not involve a lot of conversing. They might not talk and catch up a lot because just what matters is being available and present to each other um, in different ways. And then also from a co completely different context, the power of silence in negotiation. Like when you're kind of stuck in negotiation and you sort of want more, just go quiet because in particular, Americans really want to fill the space. We're very uncomfortable with silence. We don't like quiet. Quiet is not activity somehow, yet it is. I love all the different weird angles on, on silence and I'm in my head composing a little something about that. And then last thing is, I've been writing a couple of posts on LinkedIn and I'm trying to find a rhythm and a means, uh, a method that I like that really flows. And I found a way of writing that's just a sentence, a par one sentence per paragraph, almost one line. If it wraps, it's long uh, and trying to explain things. And the topic I've chosen, unfortunately, is sort of a dark one. It's my feelings about advertising. <clears throat> but I've got a couple of posts of, uh, when we uh, add, when we go to, to conversation, I'll put a couple of links in so you can see what I'm doing. Um, but it's fun. And I like, one of the things I love is trying to be as succinct as possible, trying to just be crisp and short and not make, not make things long, which is just a style. It's not, uh, 
I don't think it's a permanent thing, but I, I really like it as a style. I think it, you get a lot done really, really, really quickly. With that, I'm complete. I'll follow like uh, like Jesse and Jerry. I'm uh, I'm really grateful for the silence. I enjoy it. Uh, I really enjoy the feeling of being uh, present and attending to each other and uh, making space to feel uh, appreciated and maybe heard without speaking. That's all.
I guess that I've been thinking a lot lately about what, for lack of a better word, I'll call enablement. It, it feels to me like people keep busy because they don't know how to make a change that will help the things that they're concerned about. And I don't know how to facilitate that. I'm not engaged with large organizations in the same way that I was earlier in my life. And so I've been pondering what it's possible to do <laughs> as an individual and how to constructively influence other people. And I don't have an answer, so I'll just sort of pose the question <laughs> and uh, look forward to other people's perhaps comments. In my working with uh, Carl Habenstreit, I've been uh, immersed and sort of in wrestling to ground the work of one of his mentors, a guy named Bill Smith. And Bill developed a framework he calls AIC. And the AIC stands for Appreciation, Influence, and Control. And those three dimensions, um, he relates to the concept of power um, and, and purpose. So it's sort of a five dimensional thing. And I've been um, finding myself wallowing around in the appreciation piece. If the control piece is, you know, what I do, what I have, you know, influence, what I have impact and effect on or I'm bringing into reality um, and influences what I do with others. Um, appreciation is um, that piece of being along for the ride, 
from a place of gratitude. And my sort of parallel to all of that are the five elements as energetic dimensions of the flows and the dynamics between everything. And the silence here elementally provides space. And space is sort of the source of possibility. And um, and Dave's Dave's gift to the world of uh, the school of the possible um, <laughs> is about going to space and creating what you know wants to be created, and um, on a completely irrational and un grounded, unfounded basis. Um, I hold an optimism that um, enough folks find their way to space with others, with the amazing, you know, growing tools and affordances and capacities that human beings as clever creatures uh, have to bring to the to the party um, that there's as much of a positive space of potential for navigating our way through the challenges of this moment um, as there are the proliferation of of projected dystopia and collapse and meta crisis and the rest. The positive side of the coin just doesn't get as much press. But I think there are a lot of people, and more and more every day, that I'm finding through really oblique and bizarre paths and channels, sort of counterintuitive paths and channels, that are feeling that as well, that are creating like crazy, not in response in reaction to what's going on, but just out of a sense of nourishing and feeding and opening up and reconnecting. And um, I'm, I'm placing my bet on that. And with that, I'm complete. And with that, unless I'm mistaken, everybody has checked in. And if you have any notes or thoughts or links you'd like to share, please do so now. It's open. Um, and thank you all. Judy, when you uh, turned your video back on and were about to speak, I suddenly remembered I'm on a I'm on a private mailing list of people who attended O'Reilly's one of O'Reilly's Fu camps, which was called SciFu which is mostly scientists. So there's a whole bunch of scientists, physicists, biologists, other kinds of crazy, interesting, like smart people on this list. I mostly lurk. Um, but there've been a couple of women posting about their journeys through science. And it has been ugly and heartbreaking. And the, 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 the you know, um, Margaret Wertheim, the, the woman who does coral, uh, knit coral reefs, along with volunteers around the world to demonstrate uh, apology and geometry and a, bunch of, and a bunch of other stuff, had some heartbreaking stories um, and changed out, was going to be a scientist and went into journalism instead to write about science and then did an art piece about science because of stuff that happened to her on the way to being a scientist that just she straight out of it, wasn't gonna go there. And, and there's way, way too many stories and they're too current and there's um, too much going on. For all heaven's strike, Doug, it's, uh, uh, he's a regular on OGM. He's, he works at GSA in DC, I think. And he's also a brain fan and user.
Uh, but Judy, my my heart was breaking in remembering some of those stories, and I hate that so much of this is uh, still so current. Ah, uh, you're muted. If you want to jump in. I was just saying thank you for your thoughts, Jerry. Um, I feel pretty fortunate. I mean, everybody has a few stories, but um, I was sort of lucky coming through the channel at the right time when they were actively seeking women. <laughs> um, and, and yet the environment had not yet learned how to cope with us. <laughs> So it's a, and, and in many ways it's, <clears throat> it's changed, but it's not entirely changed. <laughs> and I think yeah. it's a, an oversimplification though, to make it a gender differentiation because the social dynamics are such, so dependent on many other things in terms of how you choose to participate, the ways you express yourself, the way you ex express appreciation for other people. There, it's just a very complex topic, but might be worthy of some deep diving by this thoughtful group, just because people have to feel included and or appreciated or both in order to be productive and contribute. And goodness knows we need every possible contribution that's available from a large segment of humanity. and. Whenever I start thinking about this, I sort of get a little melancholy and feel a little impotent because there's not a lot that I think that I can do directly, and yet I don't want to disengage. <laughs> so it's a it's a conundrum, and I don't mean to put a an unfinished idea out there, but I think it might be worthy of consideration and discussion by this group of thoughtful people. I'd be happy to frame up a, a call on the topic. Um, I, I think it's important that the women in the group be comfortable with it and want to go there because I want to, um, I don't know. I, I have a, I have only an outsider's perspective on the topic, although I care very deeply about it. And and I think I've said on a couple of OGM calls in the past that it just shocks me that the progress in women's equality as it, as much as there is has happened in our grandparents' lifetime. Like um, even the right to vote, the right to have a credit card separate from your husband, the right to no-fault divorce, the right to, like, like there's all these things that are incredibly recent. Now, there were matriarchal and matrilineal societies way back when, when things were really different and we wistfully um, talk about them every now and then. Uh, but boy, for modern for modern civilization, two words that I uh, use carefully, uh, gingerly, uh, this has just been so recent as to be uh, fragile and painful and dumb. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, recent and fragile and under threat, not by any means locked in. Um, and, you know, the pendulum by Doug. Thank you. The pendulum of history you know, sw swings back and forth. We forget. We think it's linear progression, but it's, you know, it cycles. And we're, well, we are where we are. Um, um, Judy, I'm a big fan of unfinished or, in, what did you say, incomplete ideas, um, seeds into this mix. I'm very grateful for this group. I'm very grateful for the rhythm of this conversation today. Uh, a wonderful way for me to start my day with this, with the silence and the pausing and the reflection. Um, and um, I didn't post the chat, but I confess I did post a couple of things to my own notes because really you know, some beautiful thoughts arose for me in this silence. Uh, I like what Doug said about um, what do you say, space as the source of possibility. And some reference, Dave, to something that you said about possibility, which I didn't catch, but I'd love to hear. Um, um, two things specifically. Um, uh, Judy, I appreciate the invitation. I've been thinking a lot about identity lately. 
um, and not just gender identity, but the whole identity conversation, which I, to me, my assessment is that it's a real mess. I'm not happy with it. I'm not happy with, with it from either side, the woke and the anti-woke and da 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 I think it's just like a real confusion there. Um, one part of which is, is the, uh, is the elevation of identity and self sense of self in the face of the Buddhist teachings that there maybe is no self. And so, you know, that's one dimension into a mess. And I'd love to explore that in the safety of this group. I've been very hesitant to post anything about this in the social medias because just like, you know, shit storm follows. Uh, but this is a good place, I think, to have that kind of conversation. Um, and the second thing, Stacey, back to what you said early on about um, AI and groups. Um, I've been finding, I've been really startled to find in one, in, in one of, uh, in a conversation with one of my coaching clients who's been working with my AI um, on his own between our sessions. Um, uh, we brought in into the conversations, we had a three-way conversation, him and me and the AI. And so we interrogated it and then discussed what, what it produced, what it offered to us. And it was surprisingly rich and open um, to have that additional dimension in the conversation for good and bad. I mean, some of what it said was, was useful and provocative, some of it was stupid, but we could talk about all of it. And having that kind of um, dispassionate meta view on us and our conversation, which was kind of what this was trained on, was fascinating. And so the notion of deploying it in groups uh, is really interesting. Uh, one of the things I've found, and I know any of you have been working with it have found, is that the, the quality of what it produces is highly correlated with the quality of what we put into it. Um, the specificity of the prompts, the context for the prompts, the reasons for, you know, for the sake of what am I asking you this? Um, and it's a place where, um, uh, we're entering into an era where training of humans to work with these tools is going to be as important as training the tools. Um, so that's all for now. Thank you. Um, you, Judy, go ahead. I can wait for. I was just going to say, I, I think it would be enriching to focus on the broadest spectrum of diversity possible. Because I've noticed that in dealing with groups, there's so many different characteristics of affiliation. It's not simply gender. It's the people who are outspoken, the people who are quiet. There are all of these polarities in individual traits and behaviors that influence one person's ability and inclination to try to participate if they feel as though dissenting opinions are cut off they won't offer them anymore. Um, there are many different types of examples, but I would suggest that this is a, a very complex and rich group of people and trying to understand the facilitation of human interaction in the broadest possible sense might be very rich territory for us to contemplate. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Judy. Um, Kelly, you mentioned that history is sort of like a pendulum, which is for me a, a very um, draining metaphor because it means that we're never going to make progress. We're merely going to swing from place to place where the pendulum r reaches. Could I interrupt and, you for a second? I, I, I said I said pendulum, and then I corrected myself, and I and I and I did a you know a a a, 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 a wave over time where which. Where there may be long-term patterns that hopefully trend up, but along the way, there's lots of variation, and and my my mood is very much affected by the by the how big the slice of the graph I'm looking at. If I'm looking at the moment right now, I can feel really scared and fucked up, and that uh, if I look at the longer arc, I have a little bit more serenity and perspective on it. So, uh, yeah. So it's, I'm sorry. Scrap the the pendulum because that implies that it's a forced mechanistic. It ain't that. And also, it implies that there's this, these inevitable limits to it, and that we're always but, going to revisit those yeah. those extremes yeah. of the path that it's on. Yeah. And I yeah. just wanted to offer the satire change model as a part of my mental model for this, which is that 
change happens when some incident happens and then there's backlash and it basically there's this undampened harmonic oscillation is what it's called. And then you, you wind up back and if the change was big, your course is bent. You're, you're, you're thinking differently, you're doing differently. Something has very significantly changed. And I, and I don't know how to represent this in dimensionality that makes completely clear sense, but, but that's my, my sense of it. And for me, the, the long arc of history, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's long, but it bends towards justice. It makes sense to me. I love that saying. Um, and then every now and then, you know, people get rights, people get rights, people get rights. And suddenly conservative people who, uh, reactionaries is kind of the term, who really want things the way they used to be, slap back. And the thing that shocked me was that when Dobbs passed and Roe v. Wade fell, that there was pending legislation in a dozen states or so <clears throat> that was waiting for Roe to fall and got triggered and went to, therefore went into action, uh, became law that was insanely draconian, like six week abortion bans and a, a bunch of, you know, with no recourse and all that. And I was, I was completely back footed, wrong footed by that. I, I did not expect that to be happening. All right, go ahead, Gil. You have to remember that uh, that part of the arc, this is the shorter arc, not the long arc, yeah. uh, is that um, this is, we are seeing the playing out of what year is this now, of like a 50-year strategy that's been diligent and disciplined and well-prepared, and it's no accident that those things appeared. Mm -hmm. um, there was a remarkable piece recently, where was this? Might have been Maddow on Monday. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, um, you know, as she does, she threw out the hypothetical of imagine like a highly polarized administration comes into office and reverses everything that happened before. You know, so we're obviously we're thinking about Trump and the Heritage Foundation plan and so forth. She goes back to Reagan, who also came in with a 500 page Heritage Foundation plan, cleaned house in the civil service and so forth to the extent that he could. Um, and pointed to the Department of Justice as the center of the activities of the Reagan administration transformation. Reagan came in on a landslide of that, that if you did the math, was 17% of the eligible voters. Stunning. Yes, 80% majority, but 17% of the eligible voters. Remarkable. Anyhow, the, the, the action central was the DOJ. And in the DOJ, there were two young attorneys, one named John Roberts and one named Sam Alito, who were on point for this stuff. And those guys have been working for, you know, what, 40 some odd years on the strategies that we're seeing them unfold now. Um, so... It ain't random. It's coordinated and to a degree that the that the progressive side of the American political spectrum has never been able to coordinate and hold uh, with the consistency and rigor that the so-called conservative side of the American spectrum has been able to do. Um, wow. It's, yeah. You know, and I, I put, a, put a sentence in the chat. Is that correct? Alito and Roberts were really active in Reagan's Department of Justice? Is that one? Yes, they one were. Where? Yes, they yeah. were. Uh, and yeah, so uh, Maddow Monday night, worth watching if you can. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, Other thoughts, other topics? We have 15 minutes left on the call. People brought up lots of different things in their check-ins. Go someplace else. We could wrap the call early if you'd like. We could sit in silence. We could sit in All more right, silence. Thanks. Scott's got something uh, for us. Wait, go, well, Scott, go. Yeah. Yeah. My, my yeah. provocative self. Um, I was looking through my list of things that I collect every week to see what's worth mentioning. Um, this is one that I've noticed. What... We don't believe without evidence, but what counts as evidence? And so I, I hear all these people saying, how can they think that? You know, they just don't they just don't they look at the evidence? There's there's all this evidence. And I think I don't think anybody believes anything without evidence. I think that we have misdefined what evidence is. 
people look out into the world and if they see something that matches their mental model, confirmation bias is, is evidence. I can, I can point to why, why my thinking is correct. And so this idea that, well, if we just give them more evidence, that's going to somehow correct the situation. It's, I, I just, it's something I've just been pondering that I actually think that, that everyone actually uses evidence but they might define it in a different way. Evidence as being something that proves this to me and my point of view, which again, confirmation bias. Um, so anyway, that's just a something I'd like to toss out there because I'm, I'm kind of curious if that seems to ring true. Uh, Jesse, then me. Uh, I love this, this conversation. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I really love the eight billion people and going local because that that thread alone is is worth the conversation. Um, and I also love what Dave said about uh, heard without be without speaking. That could be a book in itself. Um, and then I also loved Judith's question about how to effort efficiently. I, I don't know if I'm stating that as the right question, but um, I really do believe that what question we put out into the room creates answers and it could be inspire. It also can inspire more questions and it could be deeper superficial. Um, but when you're talking about evidence, you know, when I said I up update my profile, I was doing that. I said that because I wanted to create a mechanism for accountability for myself. And what we put in our LinkedIn head headliners is basically our vision or maybe you know, LinkedIn or wherever. But if there is a placeholder for a vision of who we want to show up as in the world, that's a good space to do that. Um, and, and in a way, everything should be aligned with that vision or feeding into it somehow. And it would be interesting to actually talk about the, the LinkedIn headers in this room alone, you know, and talk them through, like, what is your vision for life? Uh, I, I noticed, Jerry, your, yours was designing from trust. So, you know, but finding the evidence that you're doing what you value. I mean, it's showing up in this call right now, Jerry, you're doing that. That's uh, that's how I look for evidence. And um, I love the idea of evidence-based leadership. And I, I've been thinking about writing an article about that. Very, very cool topic. Um. Thanks, Jesse. I feel if I can go briefly before you. Um, I just put a link to uh, this part two, which points to part one in the, in the header about the pieces I'm writing on advertising, but that's the sort of short things. Scott, did you want to add something? Yeah, th this is more about the evidence. I'm sorry, Gil. I'll be done in just a sec here. Um, I real I had an insight about it, so thank you, Jesse. Um, instead of evidence, examining evidence, piling on evidence, what I'm realizing is what is not being examined is the mental model that is seeking the evidence. So the perspective, which is, again, all of the evidence is just information and it is converted into meaning by that mental model and the perspective. And so focusing on the facts, the facts, the facts, well, the fact isn't anything without an interpretation, without a perspective, without a meaning. And so the challenge that I've been working with with my systems thinking professors is how to get more people being aware that it is a mental model that is seeing that evidence, seeing those facts. And that's the part that needs the examination, all of us included, because we will see something and we will instantly process it through our own perspective, which may be flawed, may be incomplete. Um, so that's that's the part I think that needs the examination is not so much the state of evidence in the sense, if that makes sense. It's like look at the mental models, try to help people understand what those are and how they're built. And Scott, I was going to go back to evidence for for a second before Gil, real quick, um, which is I've mentioned this thought in my brain I think many many times on OGM, but emotion and membership trump reason most of the time. Stories are the vessel. So I have a bit of more cynical point of view than you do, Scott, because I try really hard to try to 
download, deconstruct, represent, and show people's mental models as I kind of understand them. I'm in several different ongoing email conversations with people where we're, I'm trying to sort of sense make with them, or we, we're, it's not quite a, an argument or a debate, but it's a friendly contrast of, of values. And damn, it's hard to get to the underlying model or the representations or anything like that. It is fiendishly terrifyingly difficult to get to them. And even when you get to them, you won't necessarily get agreement that those are the models or that they're flawed. Or there's like three steps you're asking for after seeing the model, which is like, oh, and by the way, your your model is broken because this fact is not true. And, that, and that's really hard. So I've, I've, I've grown to the either cynical or realistic, or maybe it's optimistic idea that what people really hang on to is narratives and tribe. And if we can make the tribe really open and welcoming, if we can make the tribe very inclusive so that people who really disagree with us feel like they're going to have membership and connection and community, even in the larger tribe, that could be a fabulous path to solving some of this horrible dilemma we've got um, of, uh, you know, that's keeping us uh, separate from each other. So sorry, Gil, thank you for your patience. Go ahead. No problem. It all fits together. Um... The the quest for mental models is kind of like looking for the pot of the gold, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, it, it, that's not going to settle things. I mean, Scott, what you're calling evidence, I would call assessments. You know, people make interpretations based on what they encounter in the world, and that's yet yeah, partly filtered through, through mental model and partly through mood and various other things. But it's all we're constructing stories all the time, um, and the quest for evidence um, is maybe caught in the assumption that we are logical beings and that we make decisions based on logic. Uh, and, you know, Flores would say we're logical, uh, that, we're, that, we're, um, um, that we're not logical as much as we are biological and emotional and historical. And we bring all that into our encounters with the world. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about how change happens. Um, for a long time, like maybe for 50 years. Uh, and I remember being struck, uh, just like flabbergasted in the, in, the, in the nuclear freeze days in the early 1980s. So Reagan administration, US Soviet missile rattling, lots of nuclear fear, a very active peace movement. And I spoke with a bunch of the leaders, um, um, uh, asking them about their vision and strategy of how change happens. And I mostly got blank stares. It was terrifying. People, mo you know, people mobilizing millions of people without a sense of what we now call theory of change. Um, so that was kind of startling. Um, uh, I, I made some notes earlier this week. I was sorry, I was rummaging for my phone trying to find them um, with a hypothesis of how change happens. And maybe this is how people change and maybe this is more societal. Uh, but it seemed to me there are four key components there, one of which is logic, you know, persuasion by argument and evidence and reason and fitting into mental models and so forth. One is fear. Um, uh, uh, one is seduction, um, being drawn toward a future that we want, not just, you know, opposing what is here now. Um, and one is compulsion. And I don't know if that's a complete set. But it was intriguing for me to just kind of lay that lay those four out on the table and think about those as some of the factors and how we change. And we we Ken's not here, so I'm going to use we freely. Um, we tend to, and I'll, I'll say we in this case is Western humans um, are uh, tend to focus on logic, which is good. Uh, what do you, what do you, what what, what do the mathematicians say? A necessary but not sufficient condition. So that's all. Huh. Judy, you're muted, and I was muted trying to tell you you're muted. It was a mess. I was just going to ask Gil if you could repeat those four categories. The four categories are logic, fear, seduction, and compulsion. Thank you. And I don't. And there were four categories of what? Sorry, four categories of. Categories I think I think how change happens, or what are the drivers of change. And I don't mean seduction in the common sense, which may have, you know, people may have an adverse reaction to it. I mean, the sense of being, um, you know, drawn towards something. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Gil. 
you bet. Uh, Judy, was that what you were asking or did you want to step in? No, I just, I, I guess I want to reiterate the thought that our attempts to separate into categories is dangerous because it limits the breadth of the conversation mm -hmm. and it gets really messy when it's broad, but if it isn't well, messy and broad, we leave things out because people won't contribute if they feel too dissimilar from the flow. So I don't know how to say that tidy in a more tidy way, um, but I think it's something to contemplate. But Judy and and Scott, you've 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 attended Cabrera seminars. You're really really skilled in the DSRP framework. You and I've talked about it a bit, and I like it. I think it's really interesting. I've not been able to arm my brain with using it regularly. But what Judy just said, and what's sort of in the air makes me think also that there are many different ways to read a situation and many different ways you could cut categories and groups and is and isn't. And sometimes the obvious one, oh, this is a company, that's a company, those are the, those are the entities, is not the actual, I'm going to use the word correct and just wince as I say it because that's not right either. But but that a different cut through the situation is actually systemically whole and complete, not necessarily obvious, but much more useful to solving that particular situation. Could be wrong. But. No, you, you're correct. Um, I think the DSRP framework, well, I don't use the word framework because it's not a framework. Um, it's been empirically <clears throat> proven through 20 years of research, unlike most frameworks, that I, which actually don't hold up and are biased and have all kinds of problems to them. Um, but the way that it's so been so interesting and helpful to me is that simply what I put in the chat, a category is a part whole grouping from a perspective. That is, a, that is the DSR defini DSRP definition. And that is a completely unbiased, provable statement. And what it does is it captures what Judith was saying and what Jerry was saying. It, and that's that's what's been so helpful to me is that it, it is, as far as I can tell in four years of study, and I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not a PhD, but I poke a lot. And I haven't found a single exception to the DSRP for patterns of thinking. And, and when you understand them, it's, it's life-changing in the way that it describes things because it's not, um, it's, 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 it's neutral. It's, it's just stunning. There is and is not. Okay, well, what, what is, what is not? Well, that's from a perspective because they, all four patterns happen at the same time. So it, it just gives you a language to say, say things without there being any kind of slant to them. All right, I know, I know our time is going. Thanks, Scott. Um, I've got to drop off and I can, I'm happy to pass the con if anybody wants to keep this conversation going. Uh, I'll the floor is yours. Does someone just say what DSRP stands for? Distinctions ah. of is, is not. A thing is made of two things. We say we identify something and that means everything else is not that. D, mm -hmm. distinctions of identity and other. Systems of parts grouped into holes. It has a nice uh, Wikipedia holes. page. I just pasted it in the chat. I'll, I'll go, I'll go look. Wikipedia, is, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. Not It'll work. That's fine. I'll um, go look there. Relationships of action and reaction. Oh, and it looks like we've lost Gil. Uh, he's, he's there. He just covered his own. Oh, okay. And then perspectives, which change what something looks like and how it's organized based on how you look at it. That's it. it that's yeah. a very Thank high you. level view, but they are Thank you. universal patterns in every mm -hmm. thought, every framework, every time. Oh, Derek Cabrera. Okay. Very good. Plus, yeah. The floor is yours, and I'm passing you the con. So when you, when you close this meeting, the meeting will end. So thanks, everybody. I've got a, got a boogie. Yeah, real quick. I mean, I'm I'm uh, um, I'm working with spiral dynamics in the V meme, right? It doesn't uh, contradict anything about DSRP. In fact, it, it's basically maintaining the same thing. But the V in the meme stands for value, so it's a value proposition of what people, the value structure, the worldview that people uh, are embedded in is guiding you know, their actions in a most predictable way. Um, it's uh, so, so 
I, I don't make it over time here, but um, I find that uh, uh, spiral dynamics is is highly predictive uh, and useful. And it's by the way, it's used in marketing. Uh, it's used in political manipulation. <laughs> it's uh, um, it is uh, uh, <laughs> to. So anyway, we are we are out of time. Bye bye, everybody.